Hi everyone, we're going to get started in just a minute. We're going to give some people another moment to sign on. We're going to get started in just a, another moment or so. Okay, we're going to get started now. So welcome everyone. Welcome to the report back from SABCS focusing on metastatic breast cancer with Dr. Matthew Ellis. My name is Christine Benjamin and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Today's webinar is a collaboration between the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network, Teresa's Research Foundation, and SHARE. The Metastatic Net Breast Cancer Network produces and offers a wide variety of up-to-date information and resources for people dealing with metastatic breast cancer. The Metastatic Breast Cancer Network is also a champion of clinical trials and research. You can find out more at mbcn.org. Teresa's Research Foundation's mission is to specifically fund research that provides better treatment and options improves quality of life for metastatic patients, and will one day lead to a cure. You can check them out at teresasresearch.org. And SHARE is a 40-year-old organization providing telephone and in-person support and educational programs for those living with breast and ovarian cancer, including 13 sessions each month for those living with metastatic breast cancer. You can find out more at sharecancersupport.org. And just so you know, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network, together with SHARE and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, will be having a metastatic meetup on March 28th at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. And Teresa's Research Foundation is hosting a metastatic breast cancer conference October 12th and 13th at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Information about the conference will be available on the website, teresasresearch.org. So during the webinar, all participants will be muted. You're welcome to submit questions throughout the presentation. You can submit questions through the question pane in the control panel on your screen. When Dr. Ellis finishes speaking, we'll open up for questions and answers. Questions that have been submitted will be read to him. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Matthew Ellis serves as the director of the Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center as Chair of the Breast Oncology at Baylor College of Medicine. He's currently the co-chair of the Translational Medicine Committee for the NRG Oncology Cooperative Group, co-leader for the Cancer Genome Atlas Breast Project, and also serves as a co-principal investigator for the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium that endeavors to translate genomic discoveries for clinical utility. Dr. Ellis, welcome, and thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, the San Antonio Symposium is one of my highlights of the year, and I think this year was particularly interesting in terms of looking at some new strategies and new approaches and new drugs that might lead to quite dramatic improvement in outcomes for patients with metastatic breast cancer. Um, um, as I think you got the impression, I'm both a clinician and a scientist, and so my job always is trying to connect sometimes these rather separate worlds to generate uh, actionable information to improve patient care. So a few uh, thoughts on metastatic breast cancer as a starting point. Um, obviously, breast cancer is a huge focus for investigation because it remains the leading cancer killer amongst women at the, in the prime of their lives. Almost all of these deaths are due to metastases, where the tumor cells spread from the breast to invade other organ systems. There are no known cures for women in whom this process is fully established, 
although personally I think I have observed a few cures in patients with HER2 positive disease, giving me some sense of hope uh, that in fact a, a cure uh, for metastatic breast cancer is not um, impossible. Indeed, it's not the cancer spreading process itself that leads to incurability, as there are many examples of metastatic tumors from other organ systems that are curable. I'm thinking lymphoma and testis cancer as examples here. So really, a cure for metastatic breast cancer is not impossible, but is rather the lack of cure as a consequence of our incomplete understanding how breast tumors arise from orderly cells lying in the breast ducts um, and transform into circulating, colonized, colonizing, and treatment refractory invaders that are, res are resistant to immune attack. So I hold all these thoughts in my mind uh, as I sit in the conference uh, looking for answers. Uh, one place to start um, when people ask me what the cause of breast cancer is, breast cancer is caused by mutations, and I just have a definition of mutations up there from Wikipedia, but the bottom line is um, the code for life uh, is found in the structure of DNA and a specific sequence uh, for, of four chemical entities called nucleotides. And there's a great deal of variation in the sequence of those nucleotides that live, give rise to all the variation in the natural world we see around us. And of course, if we look at one human to another, we'll see uh, plenty of variation in terms of how tall or short people are, what their skin color is, uh, and, 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 and all the glories of uh, the variation in, in human um, populations. Now, of course, all that variation is due to uh, gene differences that are inherited from your mum and dad, but there's another form of mutation, which is actually the cause of cancer, which is, as we get older, the DNA in our cells ages. This DNA isn't part of what we call the germline. These aren't cells that become eggs or sperms, but these are the cells that make up the rest of our body. And as these uh, cells age, uh, the, uh, these corruptions in the DNA occur that we call mutations, and over time these get selected for, uh, and these changes uh, uh, can lead to cancer. So one way you're thinking about this is the awesome power of evolution in the natural world, in, in when you're thinking about evolution in a cancer sense, it's sort of like the evolution uh, uh, on a much more rapid time scale at a cellular level as opposed to an orga or organismal level. I've got a couple of pictures up here to, to make you think about the power of evolution. Uh, at the top um, is a stonefish. Uh, this is the natural inhabitant of the reef in the Caribbean uh, and is amazingly well adapted with this beautiful ability to camouflage itself as it waits for a little fish to eat. Um, below is an invasive species called a lionfish that doesn't try to um, disguise itself at all. Indeed, it advertises its presence because it's highly poisonous with those spines on its back. And now this invasive species is eating the stonefish's lunch quite literally. Um, uh, uh, and uh, there's a big program to eradicate these. So maybe you can think about uh, this is a normal cell beautifully adapt adapted to its environment. Uh, and this is, the, this is the cancer cell, an invasive species that is eating up the environment uh, uh, causing uh, the stonefish's environment to be disrupted and the stonefish's existence uh, threatened. So uh, Darwin uh, thought about all these evolutionary processes in, in terms of this what's called branching evolution. And so in the next slide, uh, um, as we're thinking about how the stonefish and the, um, and the lionfish are competing with each other uh, for the environment, and here the selective pressure is on the small fish that they both eat, uh, you can lead to um, uh, the dominance um, of one species over another, or in cancer evolution, one cell population over another, as uh, the genetic differences favor uh, one population of cells growth over another population of cells growth. And as uh, the cancer uh, experiences different selective pressures, this might be uh, selective pressure uh, required by it to uh, extend beyond the primary tumor uh, because the primary tumor is getting crowded and now, now to survive the cancer has to spread out to set, say the lung or the liver and then after it's uh, spread to the lung or the liver there may be a further selective pressure, for example treatment with chemotherapy and that leads to another resistant population and this process occurs uh, in the patient's body over the course of their illness 
uh, until there's no space left in the patient's body uh, and, and the patient unfortunately succumbs, succumbs to the disease. So how can we intervene, intervene in this very complicated process uh, to achieve a better therapeutic outcome? Well, uh, in Shireen Loy, in her presentation on the best papers of year, included this paper, um, which is a basically an attempt to document all the genetic variation in breast cancer across the three billion base pairs that makes up the human genome. And they called it the landscape of somatic mutations in 560 breast cancers that were completely sequenced end to end. To end. It's quite a remarkable paper. And in this paper, they describe an incredibly long list of potential mutations that occur, can occur uh, in breast cancer. So subsequently, um, uh, we've all been working on what are the significance um, of uh, each individual mutation uh, in terms of uh, a patient outcome. And so you can see here uh, in this diagram, uh, it, 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 particular mutations um, over, uh, if, the, if the little squares are over on the right, um, they lead to poorer outcome for patients. And if the mutations are over on uh, the left, uh, they may lead to better outcome for patients. So interestingly, you can actually see all the variation, if you like, in human breast cancer outcomes, some patients doing incredibly well, uh, and some patients doing very poorly, is encoded by these mutations across this rather complicated list of gene functions. But for example, here, in another nice paper outlined, uh, uh, um, uh, emphasized by Shireen, um, GATA3 and MAT3K1 appear to be mutations associated with uh, 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 a low risk of dying from the disease, an observation that we made a few years ago as well, so this is confirmatory. But mutations um, that uh, are in genes such as uh, P53 and ARID1A uh, and NF1, for example, just to take a few examples of, of, of genes associated with poor outcomes. So it becomes very important to target the gene functions associated uh, with uh, poor outcome. So uh, with all that variation and, uh, in, at the genetic level in human breast cancer, we sort of are thinking about uh, what that might mean for treatment. And so uh, there have been a few drugs introduced into the treatment of metastatic breast cancer in the last year, uh, and I just wanted to go a few, a few, uh, over a few of those um, uh, to illustrate why this genetic diversity in breast cancer is such a problem. So one of the um, uh, sources uh, of hope recently have been drugs that target a particular enzyme in the cell called a cyclin-dependent kinase. Uh, as, as the name might imply to you, um, these cyclin-dependent kinases regulate something called a cyclin, and the cyclins are the drivers of the cellular proliferation in the cell. Obviously, without cellular proliferation, you can't have a cancer. And so um, this particular uh, one, uh, some uh, 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 three uh, drugs are likely to be approved that inhibit it. And they appear to have particularly useful efficacy in the setting of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, um, uh, which, while can, whilst it can be targeted nicely with drugs that interrupt the estrogen receptor, uh, resistance uh, has always been a problem. And these experiencing these patients actually experience uh, a relapse over a long period of time. And so, drugs that could assist it with ER targeting to improve. Uh, efficacy would be gratefully received. <coughs> and so, so without going into the molecular biology on this slide, but I, I can do so in the question time, um, let's look at the efficacy um, of one of these drugs, um, palbociclin. So in this trial, which is called Paloma 2, all these trials have interesting names, uh, there were uh, a the randomization to two groups of patients, uh, uh, or two groups of patient treatments. One uh, is letrozole, which was the standard. This is an estrogen-lowering drug. All these patients have advanced breast cancer. And then the second group of patients get letrozole, uh, plus this drug called palbociclin that inhibits the cyclin-dependent kinase. And you can see here the two curves are apart. So but patients, where 50% of patients have experienced a, a progression event, 
uh, on letrozole comes in at about 14.5 months after starting the therapy. And for patients who receive the palbociclin, that's extended to over uh, 24 months, a result which, of course, is highly statistically significant. And so, obviously, if you're receiving palbociclin, which is now an approved drug, uh, you'll experience a slower disease progression with your metastatic disease uh, than if you were on letrozole alone. And I'd remind you, letrozole itself is an advance over tamoxifen in this setting, uh, a previous standard. So we're gradually improving the time uh, to progression for these patients, which is extremely useful. However, you'll see that both these curves have a downward trajectory. That means that the genomic diversity of the breast cancer really means there's two types of problems. There are a group of patients who don't respond to either palbociclin or letrozole, uh, and they uh, declare themselves uh, very early on in the clinical trial. And then patients develop progression events, if you like, acquired resistance, which is generated by the fact that the tumors are diverse, they have resistance mutations or resistant populations uh, buried in those tumors, and over time, those tumors are selected for. Uh, but the good thing about uh, the uh, palbociclin story is that the drug is pretty well tolerated uh, with just some hematological toxicities that are usually easy to manage, and not many patients develop very significant uh, for infections that are related to the drug. So this is definitely an improvement. Um, but it's obviously only a partial step for all the excitement associated with these drugs. And it's a very consistent effect because a second drug called ribocyclob recently uh, highlighted uh, here uh, in a slide um, uh, that was presented during the metastatic uh, overview session uh, by Dr. Getz from Mayo Clinic. You can see a very similar uh, effect with the second drug. So we can be pretty sure that CDK4 is a very critical new target in, in, in ER positive breast cancer, and, and patients will be doing better when they're receiving these drugs. But really what one would like to be able to do is to match in one of those mutations or many of those mutations to individual drugs. So we, if you like, we have a play sheet uh, or a game plan when treating these patients. Instead of just prescribing things, we'd have what's called a predictive biomarker or a predictive gene that tells us that if this particular type of breast cancer is diagnosed with a particular type of gene defect, you would reach for a particular drug to improve the situation. And to show you how this might work, again, uh, from, uh, um, um, uh, from uh, Dr. Getz's um, presentation, uh, is this trial uh, involving a drug called bupalacid, uh, which uh, it attacks a particular set of enzymes in another pathway called the PI3 kinase pathway. And you can see here uh, that uh, the drug really, um, can you hear me okay? Getting some odd noises. Um, the drug only um, works effectively when um, The drug only appears to work effectively uh, when the um, a particular mutation called a PI3 kinase mutation is present. Now the problem with this drug is it turns out not to be uh, tolerable. Uh, there are, the side effect burden was thought to be too high, uh, but nonetheless uh, a, a, a big clue here that drugs in this pathway could be helpful to metastatic patients and uh, better drugs with uh, uh, less side effects. Um, are also in clinical trials. So I think it's possible in the next year, in addition to the CDK4-6 uh, story, we may have another story with a class of drugs that uh, can be targeted uh, through the diagnosis of a mutation in PI3 kinase. Another thing uh, that was highlighted by Dr. Loy is that we have new ways to define therapeutic targets. We heard all about gene sequencing and a big emphasis on DNA, uh, but sometimes an understanding of exactly how all these DNA uh, uh, mutations are, are driving cancer biology and how we might drug them has become a little difficult to understand just because of the complexity of it. So some of us uh, have been working in an area called proteogenomics, and the way I like to describe this field is that 
if, you, if you're all looking at that computer uh, that you're using to hear me talk, uh, the, um, the, the DNA can be considered to be the hard drive with all the uh, information uh, on it, but that information has to be sucked out of the hard drive uh, through wires to put it onto the computer screen, and that's the RNA, the RNA in a sense is the wiring, and the computer seat itself is, is obviously uh, composed of proteins. When we're looking at each other, um, we're looking at proteins uh, working on a uh, micro uh, to nanosecond timescale. So, so proteins form the um, computer screen of life. And uh, the more we understand about how the proteins work, a deeper understanding of the biology uh, we'll get. Uh, uh, that is driven by all those DNA corruptions. So this field proteogenomics has just been born, again highlighted by Shireen, uh, but you can see here in this particular figure from this paper, uh, uh, the result, uh, the, the, an answer to the question, why don't we have more targets like ERB2, which uh, as I think most people on the line will know has been an incredibly successful target. Uh, well, it turns out because uh, it, it turns out we didn't have the right techniques to identify um, an additional rb 2 like targets until this kind of technology came along. And you can see, for example, here, uh, there's a target called PAC1 on 11Q. Uh, a change in gene copy is clearly driving a high level of activity of this enzyme, and there's a scramble to make drugs against PAC1. Um, um, and the preclinical studies with tool compounds are, are looking very promising. So again, uh, more sophisticated ways to look at cancer cells uh, and make the diagnosis of driving events that can be drugged. Now, uh, one other thing that's really vexing uh, for metastatic breast cancer patients is the need for tissue biopsy. Um, obviously, biopsying a lesion in the breast is relatively straightforward. Uh, the breast is on the outside of the body and can be safely bi uh, biopsied. Um, uh, with appropriate local anesthesia in a relatively simple way. Um, but of course, metastatic breast cancer is buried in internal organs, and to, to sample it requires a deep tissue biopsy, which is both uh, ha carries some risks and is also a much more complicated uh, undertaking in terms of the you know, imaging considerations. Uh, and so, uh, one of the fields that uh, uh, was emphasized by Ben Ho Park was. Uh, in answer to this question, can we make the diagnosis of mutations in breast cancer easier? Um, and so uh, Ben uh, works at Johns Hopkins and is an expert in something called cell-free plasma tumor DNA. So in this simple diagram, uh, you can get the idea here. The cancer cells actually liberate their genome into the bloodstream. Uh, and these, uh, this DNA uh, circulates. It has a relatively short half-life. But there's, this process is efficient enough uh, that uh, the gene sequence in the tumor can literally be um, uh, identified from just a simple tube of blood without the need of a deep tissue biops biopsy. Obviously, this is quite a complicated uh, problem, needing some quite cool technology. Uh, ben uses something called digital PCR. There are other technologies. But thinking of it, think, so his analogy is it's a bit like where's Waldo? Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, if you look carefully, you can find Waldo. Uh, and if you think about it, what we're really doing is finding the Waldo of the uh, breast cancer genome by analyzing the peripheral blood. So to give an example of how uh, this technique um, is trying to solve a medical problem, um, as, uh, as we've uh, found out over the last several years, the, the reason why uh, patients develop risk resistance to anti-hormone therapy in breast cancer is that the estrogen receptor itself becomes mutated. Not very frequently at presentation in the primary breast cancer, but alarmingly frequently in patients with advanced breast cancer that's become resistant to uh, uh, anti-hormone therapy. And you can see here um, uh, some of the different mutations uh, that can occur in the estrogen receptor. And now using the technology described by Ben, uh, this diagnosis can be made from the peripheral blood. Why would this matter? Uh, well, of course, uh, uh, this might uh, lead to a new drug that can target the mutant receptor. Um, and uh, I was thinking about this uh, recently as we look at the result of this particular study, which is advanced breast cancer uh, treatment um, uh, for hormone receptor positive disease, uh, comparing a previous standard uh, 
uh, called anastrozole, again an aromatase inhibitor reducing estrogen levels versus forbestrin, a highly potent injected anti-estrogen. And in fact, in this trial, particularly for patients with, uh, out without immediately life-threatening a metastatic breast cancer, the injections with fulvestrin do do better than the anastrozole. But why would that be the case? Well, I think there's in, some reasonable evidence that whilst the response rate to fulvestrin and anastrozole are pretty equivalent, it's the fact that uh, the acquisition of, of resistance mutations is actually slower than with the fulvestrin than with the anastrozole. Uh, and if the acquisition of resistance is slower, that would mean you're probably better off starting off with the fulvestrant rather than the anastrozole uh, because your response will persist for longer before the patient needs uh, um, other forms of usually more toxic therapy. One question uh, I often get asked, given uh, that our attempts to drug these genes one by one uh, becomes a bit like a game of whack-a-mole, Whilst you can get remissions, there's always those resistant clones uh, that grow out, terminating the effectiveness of the uh, intervention. One idea is to either combine uh, or to uh, use um, immune therapy uh, to treat those uh, mutations, a completely uh, different approach. So um, this was, uh, I thought, an excellent lecture by Leisha Emmons from Johns Hopkins again. Um, and uh, so uh, it's obviously been a long-standing concept that cancer is, um, immune, is, is, is uh, held in check by the immune system. Uh, we know, for example, that patients who have um, uh, bone marrow transplants or they have HIV AIDS and they have immune compromise, they are at risk of certain, uh, increased risk of certain forms of cancer. Uh, but patients with, patients with apparently normal immune system uh, who aren't developing uh, uh, lots of infection problems due to invasive uh, funguses or bacteria, they seem to have a normal immune system, it turns out that um, uh, they're, not attacking, they don't, they're not attacking their cancers because the cancer itself has created something called an uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment. You can think of it like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. The cancer cloaks itself uh, in a way that prevents the immune system from attacking it. The immune system would love to attack the cancer cell because the cancer cell has all those DNA corruption in it, in it giving rise to um, non-natural peptides that should be attracted uh, 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 should be a target from the immune system. But this invisibility cloak comes in that it prevents the immune system attacking the tumor cell comes in all sorts of forms, uh, one of which is um, these uh, 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 so-called immune checkpoint molecules that involve uh, something called uh, PD-1 and its ligand PD-L1. And it, it, when these are engaged, uh, they prevent the uh, T cell uh, from uh, killing the cancer cell. But if you can block the PD-1 or the PD-L1, uh, you can actually get uh, uh, the uh, immunity of the natural immunity of the patient engaged and the cancer cell can be killed. So how effective is this um, in breast cancer? Well, um, if we look at the immune response within breast cancers, we can see that uh, certain poor prognosis factors, such as being estrogen receptor negative and high grade, high, grade, high grade and lymph node positive, often associated with higher T cell infiltrates, which is obviously good, that's what you want, you want those T cells to kill the cancer. But those T cells, uh, whilst present and recognizing uh, the presence of the tumor and wanting to kill it, they're held in check by the PD-1, PD-L1 and other systems. So in various clinical trials, looking at uh, uh, various uh, drugs targeting either the ligand, the PD-L1 or the, or the receptor, PD-1, uh, you can actually see that um, the, there are, are response rates, particularly in patients with triple negative breast cancer and particularly in uh, 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 breast cancers that got signs of a partial immune attack that is being, uh, that's being thwarted by the PD-1, PD-L1 system. And some of these uh, responses have been quite durable. Uh, the drugs themselves 
are reasonably well tolerated, although in some patients they unleash an autoimmunity problem, uh, which uh, requires patients to be treated promptly with steroids. Um, but of course, if you have metastatic breast cancer, uh, that, uh, that is often uh, a deal uh, that you would accept, uh, because in the right patients, these drugs can be very effective. Still not approved for the treatment of breast cancer, but it's clear that breast cancer can be uh, immunogenic, whilst there's multiple layers of regulation within the tumor microenvironment that shuts down tumor immunity, we're beginning to dissect these various layers and coming up with ways to intervene. And I think really uh, within the next uh, maybe three to five years, these immune checkpoint blockades will become standard of care. I think in some patients with poor prognosis breast cancer of all subtypes. Leading us to, to, for me to uh, think about um, a presentation by uh, Nick Wagley, who has been uh, the forefront of asking ourselves uh, whether we can involve more patients in metastatic breast cancer research. Because whilst sitting in the laboratory and studying breast cancer at the level of cell lines or model systems is, of course, important, in the end, we have to study patients in order to prove that our advances in, in, in the lab um, are really meaningful in terms of what happens to individual patients. So he's developed something called the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project, which is basically pairing directly with patients to accelerate our understanding of metastatic breast cancer. And here's a few statistics which I think really are at the, the, the core of what's holding us back from a cure for metastatic breast cancer. On the top left, he makes a statement, I agree, and it may be even less than this, only 5% of U.S. cancer patients are enrolled in clinical trials. Certainly only 5% of patients with metastatic breast cancer are enrolled in clinical trials. And that's just plainly unacceptable from my perspective and, and, and unacceptable from many women's perspective. Uh, and, and part of this is because many patients with metastatic breast cancer uh, live in places uh, where um, uh, clinical trial availability is spotty. Whilst many community oncologists do offer clinical trials, uh, that's not uniformly the case. And uh, the, the, the community oncology trial portfolio may be more uh, limited than it is in an academic center, but not everyone can go to an academic center just logistically. And so, and another thing that's holding, holding us back is many tumor samples have not been readily available for study. There's literally millions of bits of breast cancer sitting in the basement of many pathology departments around the country and they're not accessible for research. So by partnering directly with patients, maybe we can address some of these issues. And so uh, there's a website that allows uh, uh, folks to uh, volunteer. Uh, and when they volunteer, uh, they, 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 there's a simple system uh, that um, allows the patient to, to record her story or, or, or indeed his story. Um, they uh, give permission for the uh, investigators to collect information on them, but also their samples. And then uh, they really want to engage patients uh, in a longitudinal way uh, and keep um, engaged. And I think the next step, and Nick fully agrees with me on this, is that uh, to have this as a way to uh, have the patients participate in projects that are more than just specimen collection, but clinical studies and clinical investigations uh, and, and have the patients work uh, through this system, through their local oncologists uh, to uh, generate a, a learning, an iterative learning uh, setting where we can make more progress. You can see how successful he's been recruiting patients from all over the United States. Um, I'm sure he's over 3,000 women and men with metastatic breast cancer at this point. And uh, the key, uh, I think, uh, is uh, to make it relatively straightforward uh, to, uh, to, to start the process um, and uh, then uh, engage the patients long term uh, in, in, in the, these types of projects. And you can see there's a variety of levels of involvement from uh, providing online consent and tissue and medical histories and uh, tissue collections leading to genomic analyses and interpretation and data sharing. And you can see here um, how successful this has been in, in terms of patients volunteering uh, uh, to his project. 
And here's a few testimonials. Uh, patients, uh, in my experience, uh, really want to participate in the answer. Uh, no one has a more vested interest in research than they do. Uh, and perhaps the community has not been uh, active enough in engaging patients directly. Uh, uh, and so we need to break down the silos between patients and institutions and doctors and researchers and, 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 and make this a huge coalition of the willing. So um, uh, a number of people have been working uh, on this moving forward uh, and there's people online who might uh, like to consider participating either in Nick's project or in new projects that are being uh, uh, rolled out over the course of the year with the NBC Alliance. Uh, and, and perhaps with this uh, silo-breaking uh, interactions between researchers, clinicians, industry, patients, and patient advocates, uh, we'll discover uh, cures for metastatic breast cancer uh, that we've so uh, waited for so long. So I've been talking here uh, really for 35 minutes, and I was, uh, I was impressed by both the number of attendees and the number of questions that people wanted to ask. So I decided to keep my talk relatively brief uh, and, and get to a question and answer session. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Sorry about the odd pinging in the middle. I seem to have solved it there. Yeah, I just took myself off speaker. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a bunch of questions. So the first question, in your opinion, which is the most promising research advancement announced at San Antonio? Um, I think that the debate around immune therapies for breast cancer is probably uh, the, the, the biggest uh, cutting edge uh, at this point. I mean, there weren't, there weren't uh, if you like, uh, dramatic phase three results uh, that were uh, showing dramatic improvements um, announced at the symposium, but certainly over the course of the year, we, we did see, uh, uh, obviously, all the data on the CDK4-6 inhibitors, but I'm most fascinated by the immune system work uh, uh, and because I, I think there is a, a possibility of, of driving the cure, or at least some cures for metastatic breast cancer, because um, we've seen uh, such promising results in other uh, uh, solid malignancies. Thank you. Okay, next question <clears throat> about uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Other than the immunotherapy that you discussed, was there anything else presented? Well, as a general uh, thought, uh, and uh, Dr. Andrew Tutt, uh, again, was discussing um, some of the work that he's been doing on triple negative breast cancer chemotherapy, and also um, his institute, the Institute for Cancer Research, um, uh, has been at the forefront in PARP inhibitor therapy. I would say that in triple negative breast cancer, the targeting defects in DNA repair was, was, was extensively discussed, and uh, new PARP inhibitors or ways to prevent PARP inhibitor resistance or ways to combine PARP inhibitors um, with immunotherapy um, or new uh, uh, what we call synthetic lethal hypotheses that are beyond PARP inhibition. All these things, I think, are, are actually very promising and could, can create chemotherapy regimens that are much more precise and less, less toxic and perhaps more efficacious. So um, that, that is, that's, a, that's a big promise. And I did notice yesterday that a second PARP inhibitor um, uh, it looks like it's going to get approval for ovarian cancer, uh, which is very like triple negative breast cancer. So, so I think just as uh, the palpocyclic type drugs have making a, a difference in your positive disease, I think in I think in within the right patient populations, I think that PARP inhibitor uh, are, are going to uh, come into uh, you know approved usage in triple negative breast cancer as well. Thank you. So in, in the beginning, you mentioned that you've seen some cures for HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. Can you please categorize the nature of the cure? So these are all patients that I've treated over the years, uh, and I've talked to other people and have had similar experiences. Um, uh, all patients are treated with Herceptin, 
Uh, some of them are now being treated with Herceptin Pertuzumab as first-line uh, metastatic treatment. Most of these patients have relatively limited metastatic disease, for example, mediastinal uh, lymphadenopathy um, or, um, or inoperable locally advanced disease, or, or even very occasional patients with, a, with, a, with limited liver metastases go into first remission with their HER2 targeted therapy and then go on to multiple years of Herceptin maintenance and then at some point, six, seven, eight years out, the Herceptin is held and the patients don't relapse. And so um, uh, I think uh, that's what I was referring to, uh, those remarkable extreme responders to HER2 targeted treatment. So someone was asking about the slide that you showed about circulating cell-free. Yes. Is that, is that liquid biopsy? <clears throat> yes, there's a, no, there's a number of different sort of terms for it, but uh, liquid biopsy is another term for it. Yeah. And so is, li is liquid biopsy being used in practice? And if so, are all liquid biopsies created equal? Well, uh, the answer is yes, people, uh, doctors are beginning to use these tools for their metastatic breast cancer patients. They are available uh, from commercial labs. Uh, but we're just beginning really to explore the value of this kind of technology and know they aren't all created equal. Um, so uh, they vary from uh, panels of just a very small number of genes, uh, typically, for example, that liquid biopsy, approach uh, using digital droplet PCR that Dr. Park works with. But there are other technologies um, which are based on something called next generation sequencing that can look at larger panels of genes and they can look at genes in unbiased ways. In other words, they don't need to know the mutation that you're looking for in advance. They're unbiased genes and they're very, um, they're, 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 they're quite sensitive. Uh, and so, um, so question one, you know, is if you find a mutation in a liquid biopsy, does that mutation indicate uh, uh, that uh, when matched with a drug, a patient will do better? And there is a little hint of that. Uh, I think in the bupalacid data I showed, uh, they made the diagnosis of the PIK3CA mutation from liquid biopsy, and that seemed to predict the efficacy of the drug. So that's proof in principle. I think that estrogen receptor mutations diagnosed this way um, uh, uh, are, are, I think, pretty clearly predicting the patient won't, won't respond um, to a, uh, a, a continued treatment with an aromatase inhibitor. And I think also we'll see that her, uh, HER2 mutations diagnosis way uh, do predict the eff effectiveness of HER2-directed therapy. In terms of um, other uses for liquid biopsy, uh, there's really two. Um, you can also use these approaches to follow responses. So if you target a mutation successfully, that mutation can clear from the system. So that might be an easier way uh, to follow patients than repeated CT scanning, and that's something that people are also investigating. And then um, finally, and I think this might take a little bit of improvement in sensitivity, but liquid biopsy may also ultimately be used in the very early disease setting when we're trying to cure patients who have very limited metastatic disease, um, uh, the so-called adjuvant setting. And we may actually be able to detect mutations with sufficient um, sensitivity uh, that we can find out those patients who were cured with their initial chemotherapy and those patients who still have persistent disease and might be eligible for additional interventions following the success of that therapy uh, with liquid biopsy. So that's kind of a future, a future thought, but I think the liquid biopsy concept has legs and uh, it's going to be used in a variety of different ways, um, probably more than just the ones I mentioned. Okay, thank you. Someone is asking is if there is any research into whether drug holidays may help resistance. That is a very clever question. And so um, mutations arise uh, because, um, uh, because there's selective pressure for that particular clone. Uh, when you take that suppression 
that, 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 that selective pressure off, then that clone actually may not be that fit, and it may actually, do, may actually uh, regress. And um, I think you could obviously test that high, hypothesis using the liquid biopsy approach. And there are some uh, feelings that these, these, these uh, drug holidays, particularly for targeted therapies, might actually be quite helpful. Um, we thought of this many years ago, using estradiol to treat patients with metastatic breast cancer, as it may clear the resistant clones, allowing you to restart something simple like an aromatase inhibitor cycling uh, between estrogen stimulation and estrogen deprivation. Um, and uh, whilst I, think, I still think that's true, I don't see patients very treated that way. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think that the ability to track mutations um, might actually lead to a uh, revisiting of this important hypothesis. Thank you. So there are there are several questions about genomic sequencing. When is the best time to do this, and is it covered by? Is it usually is it generally covered by insurance or Medicare? Okay, so um, <clears throat> the best time to do it um, is to inform it on a treatment decision that you have before you. And so if you have metastatic breast cancer, the best time to do the test is at the time you want to change the treatment because obviously the metastatic genome changes over time. And so you do it uh, uh, upon progression uh, and then oh, hopefully there's a druggable hypothesis that arises from it. Uh, bear in mind, quite often there isn't a druggable hypothesis, or the drug in question is experimental. Um, it's not uh, uh, available for easy prescription. Um, uh, so uh, a lot of this uh, remains in the realm of research, which is why, in general, uh, 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 Medicare and Medicaid services are not, uh, uh, in the main, um, reimbursing for genomic sequencing. However, there are companies that can provide genomic sequencing for, uh, for free uh, as part of clinical investigations. There are institutions as part of institutional efforts providing genome sequencing um, for free. Um, and so uh, it, it is accessible, but sometimes uh, it's complicated and quite often isn't accessible um, in community settings in patients who have government insurance. So it remains complicated, and in part it's remaining complicated because we still don't have a clear understanding of the relationship between these mutations and clinical decisions. Um, but we're obviously working very hard on it, and um, I think I mentioned three types of mutations, PIP3CA mutation, HER2 mutation, and ESR1 mutation, where you can see uh, where the research is taking us in terms of medical decision making. But quite often these panels are very extensive, and many of the genes that are investigated um, are not particularly relevant to breast cancer because they typically will do a gene panel that's relevant to multiple diseases. But in the end, that might lead to some unusual discoveries of mutations that really dominate in other diseases, occasionally showing up in breast cancer because it's so diverse. And then the question is, if you use the mutation match drug that's usually used for melanoma, for example, Will it work in the occasional breast cancer that has a melanoma-like mutation? And that, of course, is a research question that's being asked by a variety of different um, uh, molecular medicine initiatives, like the TAPER study with the American Society of Clinical Oncology is just one example of that, and also the National Cancer Institute uh, uh, basket trials. And so uh, these are all available uh, through typically academic medical centers, which brings me back to my earlier uh, comments on how we need to democratize availability, uh, make this testing more widely available, uh, so that we can develop the case for full reimbursement. So someone is asking about the role of uh, technology and digital technology. How does that play on the future of treating metastatic breast cancer? Um, and there was something Sorry, I, I lost a few critical words there uh, to the internet. Could you repeat the question, please? 
So what is the role of digital and technology playing on future treatment of metastatic breast cancer patients? And, uh, and someone else mentioned something about Watson, so maybe you can combine those two questions. <clears throat> so what I think the questioner is getting at is how we can connect patients uh, directly to the clinical research community in ways that are perhaps independent of their treating oncologist, uh, although they're, they're obviously treating oncologists would always be an ally, and ways that are perhaps independent of uh, big institutions, uh, but uh, a coalition, if you like, that is taking advantage of digital media, taking advantage of social media, uh, to create a learning network. Um, and I think that's one of the revolutions we'll see in the next three to five years. Because clearly, the current way we're doing things uh, isn't giving us the answer. If, only, if we're only studying 5% of the population with metastatic breast cancer, um, uh, we'll never get to the cure. right? So we need to be studying more like 20 to 30% of the population. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is all that genomic diversity I was talking about. Uh, we need large populations of patients uh, uh, to define the subsets for particular interventions. So take, for example, if this, let's say right now there's 150,000 women approximately living with metastatic breast cancer, of course, women and men living with metastatic breast cancer, and there's a mutation present in 1% of that 150,000, um, that, um, you know, could dramatically respond to a drug if you could just find that 1%. Well, that 1%, uh, it, you know, still means many thousands of patients with that particular subset, you know, uh, the frequency of that population could be bigger than many of the uh, leukemias that we love to treat because they have dramatic responses. And so uh, we need to really engage I'd say the majority of patients in metastatic breast cancer research if we're really ever going to make progress. And where Watson and other uh, sort of informatics, <coughs> informatic solutions might come in um, is, of course, providing the infrastructure of connecting these patients, their complicated genomes, with the medical interventions that we need. Because uh, clearly, um, I think some kind of intelligent learning processes required here that is beyond the uh, abilities of any individual investigator uh, to achieve. It's almost like we need to plug the information, both clinical uh, uh, and genomic and proteomic, into a decision-making machine which could tell us um, how to treat the patient in, 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 and make that uh, widely available. Now, can we do that? I think yes. Is it going to take time? I think yes. And what it needs most is patient volunteers because the learning process is going to require uh, a lot of patient information. Does that answer the question? So there are several questions about lobular metastatic breast cancer. Yes. And if there's anything to report from San Antonio that that you can share with us, that would be great. I just, I also want to mention that we're providing a webinar on January 30th. If you go to the SHARE website, you'll see it there. The date was changed. It's January 30th at 3 o'clock Eastern Time on um, lobular cancer. But if you well, have anything, you can tell yes, us I, now. I, yes, I do have something important to say about that. Um, so lobular cancer is an important subset of breast cancers, perhaps about 1%, uh, and they've lost a gene that's required for um, the cells to stick to each other, sort of intracellular cement, if you like. The gene's called E-adherin. Um, and basically, these metastatic lobular carcinoma cells can sort of slide their way between the tissues, along tissue planes, on the surface of organs, uh, giving rise to unusual metastatic patterns uh, for example, uh, in the abdomen, causing intestinal obstruction, in the lungs, causing fluid accumulation, uh, even metastasis to the eyes and the skin and to the brain. Now, um, a subset of lobular carcinomas 
uh, uh, harbor a mutation in the HER2 gene. So these mutations don't, aren't diagnosed with the usual HER2 testing, but measure something like gene copy change, uh, so-called gene amplification. These mutations are very subtle, uh, but they activate the HER2 kinase, and they cause uh, the HER2 to be activated, but you can intervene using a drug uh, called neratinib, uh, which switches the mutant HER2 off. And so there was some discussion about targeting HER2 mutations, which are enriched in lobular carcinoma, and there are a variety of trials that patients can participate in. And in fact, there's free HER2 mutation testing available through the Army of Women. Uh, and so you just Google Army of Women HER2 mutation, and um, a patient can work out how to send her block, or he can work out how to send uh, his block uh, for free HER2 mutation testing and entry into the clinical trial. And these trials uh, sort of have a futuristic look about them. Uh, you only have to go to the academic medical center once every three months for the scan. In the meantime, uh, your, your, the drugs are provided and the care and the monitoring of patients provided by the community oncologist. So I think we need more studies like that uh, so that these drugs become, these investigations become more widely available. So for lobular carcinoma, uh, definitely hurts your mutation, uh, which may be present in somewhere between 10, 15, or 20 percent of patients uh, should definitely be a consideration. So a recent scientific article pointed out that mutations vary by the sites being biopsied. Yes. So then how do we decide where to biopsy? Gosh, well, that's a great question. It's a tough thing. I mean, the pragmatic answer, you biopsy the safest area, but it may not have all the mutations that are present in that tumor, and, and, and therefore there can be discordance. But of course, cancers, unfortunately, are continuously evolving and so the mutations present in a patient's liver metastasis may not be present in their bone metastasis or their lung metastasis. So this is thought to be partially why liquid biopsy is so appealing, because in a sense, in a tube of blood, you're getting uh, pooled information from all uh, mutations that might be present, as long as the mutations are above the limit of detection. And you'll be able to tell by the relevant, what they call allele frequencies, the, 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 the concentration of mutation, uh, which ones are like to be in all clones and which ones are like to be in just in subclones. So, it, as, as I sort of tried to intimate at the beginning, this is a very complicated process. And, and then using the liquid biopsy, you can gauge the presence of each mutation over time, watching new mutations appear and other mutations disappear as a result of treatment. Okay, so um, can a drug or chemotherapy that was used successfully in a patient many years earlier, but then eventually failed, can it be used again with success? <coughs> That's universally the case for almost all therapeutic approaches. So if a patient received chemotherapy many years ago and now needs chemotherapy again, you can use the same drugs uh, with success. Um, uh, of course, in metastatic disease, those drugs are unlikely to be curative, so they might be helpful. Same is true for a reintroduction of anti-hormonal therapy. If a patient had tamoxifen in the adjuvant setting, and now it's, they've had a relapse 10 years after that, uh, then reintroduction of tamoxifen is quite likely to produce a response. Uh, but the response uh, will not be uh, a curative response, obviously it'll be uh, but it may be useful in terms of buying some time. So uh, uh, oncologists will frequently do this, but of course, the more frequent, the, 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 if, the, if the resistance to that drug was in the very recent past, uh, reintroduction of the drug is much less likely to be effective. So it's all a question of timing. Uh, so we probably have about 30 seconds left. Um, Any, someone wants to know about uh, diet recommendations. I know that there was, there was sort of a lot presented about uh, maintaining healthy weight. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, a few things about that that people are thinking about weight and breast cancer is would aggressive intervention help? Would, uh, 
would, would surgical interventions, would uh, medications that reduce weight uh, help? Um, would uh, drugs that treat diabetes, such as metformin, often used in diabetes associated with overweight, help breast cancer outcomes? Um, uh, uh, you know, are there particular diets should that should be favoured in patients with, with with metastatic or early stage breast cancer? I think these are very important research questions uh, where the risks and benefits need to be studied in formal ways. And I'm pleased to see that there are continuing interest in formal uh, diet and weight loss uh, studies in breast cancer. And I think in metastatic breast cancer, it remains also uh, an important area um, where, at least in animal systems, you can actually get experimental breast cancers to regress uh, through calorie restriction alone in the setting of, of, of otherwise, um, you know, obese mice. So I think that I think there's a lot to be uh, considered here, uh, and we need to do more investigation. But in general, the advice is to is to stay active, even if you have metastatic breast cancer, uh, and to eat, you know, uh, sensibly and uh, uh, with an emphasis on um, uh, the usual control of sugars, fats, and and, and uh, uh, the diets rich in fruit and veg. So thank you. We're out of time. So I'd like to thank Dr. Ellis for an informative program. Thank you all for participating. And please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Dr. Ellis, thank you so much. I hope that was informative. It was. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.